Further evidence that language arises from a network of sites in the brain comes from the work of Professor George Ogerman. Here at Washington University in Seattle, he has pioneered an impressively direct way to study language in the brain. His research began as part of a last-ditch effort to treat severe epilepsy through surgery. The challenge is to remove enough of the epileptic brain tissue without destroying key functions like speech. To plan the exactly what tissue I want to take out, there are two pieces of information I, uh, I want to have. One is that I want to know where the local epileptic activity is in the brain, and I get that by recording the brainwave activities directly from the, the cortical surface. The other is that I want to know where the functionally important things are so I can stay out of them. I'm a little wider. Hi. You're in the operating room. Can you wake up a little bit so we can talk to you? Uh -huh. Dr. Ogeman's doing his work. Here, actually, does your nose itch? Let me get that for you. In order to test for language, George Ogeman needs his patients fully awake. It's a fantastic opportunity to probe the workings of the living brain. That's Dr. Ogeman. You recognize his voice? Shiver, clap. Okay. Now be real, real still. Okay. okay. Ogerman stimulates the brain oh. with a tiny electric current. The patient feels no pain since there are no pain sensors in the brain. Um. He maps out the exposed surface with paper numbers, then he stimulates each area in turn. Okay, don't move your arm, okay? I'd like you to count for me now. I'd like you to start at one and just keep counting until I tell you to stop. Okay. Nice and okay, loud. Use good and loud. Start, please. One, two, three. Ogerman has shown four, that even a basic language function, five, like counting, six, relies on a widespread seven, network of sights. Nine. If he hits one of these essential speech areas, the electric current will stop the patient in her tracks. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, six. Ah. 17, okay. 18, 10, 19. He's also found that everyone's network is laid out differently. Thank you. You can stop. That's very nice. In any individual subject, the sites involved in language are very focal, very localized ones about the size of the end of my thumbnail. But if you look across the population and you say, now, how, how are these distributed? There's a lot of variance. They're in somewhat different locations in most people. The team here have mapped over 200 people, and they've never found exactly the same mosaic of language sites twice. These are just the essential ones. They probably represent key intersections in an even wider network of areas involved in language. I'm going to go to electrode number one, four milliamps. You are at four. This is a barn. When George Ogerman asks his patients to respond to a slideshow, then we can really see the awesome sophistication of the brain's language system. Chicken. Uh -huh. 27 inferior. Piano. Uh -huh. This is my, this is my boom, right? Keep going, please. This is a bad. This remarkable technique reveals separate networks for many different aspects of language. 30. What we find is that the cortex is organized in these separate areas for different language functions. So, for example, in a multilingual patient, you'll find one area that's involved in naming in one language, another area that's involved in naming the same items in another language, at least partly separated. This is a lion. The brain mapping has even shown that there are separate areas for different categories of word. We seem to have a network dedicated to naming fruits and another for naming tools. This is a straw. So. This is an eye. 32. Yep. Screwdriver. Mm -hmm. In a general sense, Wernicke and Broca got it right. But we've certainly learned that the details are different uh, in the sense that the uh, the areas that are crucial for a language function are more focal than we thought. There's more individual variability than we thought between them. There's more subdivisions than we thought.